These days have become too familiar. A promising career ended abruptly by concussion. Nathan Murphy was told on the weekend by a medical panel he couldn't be playing on. He conveyed that message to teammates moments ago. So at 24, his career ends in the AFL. His last game is a winning grand final. It's a complicated legacy in its own right as he suffered a concussion in the first quarter. What there is no doubt was his influence in the Collingwood defence and how he was able to propel himself and his team toward that ultimate glory. Angus Brayshaw was a sobering moment last month, and this is equally so today. Nathan Buckley is with me as he knows Nathan Murphy intimately. So, Bucks, welcome. Go, Jared. Just your, your first blush reaction. Yeah, look, it's it is disappointing for the young man from a professional standpoint. Um, he had to work hard to to get his opportunities. He, he chose football over cricket. He was a very good cricketer, um, and he was courageous to a fault. He used to go back, like even the VFL when he was coming in, lightly framed. It took a while for us to work out where to play him. He was a half forward flanker in the junior footy. Um, marking player, lead up player, started playing him on the wing and then he went down back, just kept going back into the hole, knocking himself out. It happened consistently at training, in games and then he, then he, then he had a really bad ankle injury. So he, he struggled through his first probably 24 months, uh, three seasons in, in, the, in the AFL system and he blossomed. He had a few opportunities in 2018, but he blossomed when he, he got his opportunity as a deep forward, as a tall for, as, as a as a deep back, and as a tall back, and was a, as you said was a significant um, part of um, you know the premiership last year. So it was a, it's a real shame for him from a professional standpoint. But in the end, he's he's a great young man. He has he has put his best foot forward consistently. Um, he's made a decision that, you know, along with the medicos that he's had to make and he's got a, a bright future ahead of him at whatever he, he wants to chase because of his attitude and his, um, you know, the, the character that he is. He played 24 games last season and a lot of what he was able to do, um, reconstruct the, the, the dynamic of that back line. How would you describe his influence in that premiership year? Yeah, what I witnessed um, was just his his smarts and his spatial awareness. He he learned really well to when to drop off a man and where the dangerous space was. He became a really good defender without the ball or outside of the contest. And and he and he actually, you know, the the contested situations he found himself in, some of the contests that he halved that he had no right to. And some of the balls that he won from an intercept perspective, he 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 was just always there. So he became a really dependable part of that that back six. So when you think about the yeah, and and he he wasn't a, a big offensive threat. He was a he was a he kept it simple in regards to offense and and shared the ball, shifted the ball to players that were going to be more creative and use it better. But what he became is if you're going hard forward, you need someone when that fails, you know, when you get cut in half on a run and carry or when you miss a target and it comes back the other way, you need someone there as the backstop that's going to win an outnumbered contest or slow the opposition rebound down or knock it out of bounds to start again. And that's exactly what he became. So he was the backbone for Darcy Moore. He was, he was the backbone for Jeremy Howe at times, um, for Isaac Quainer. For Nick Dacos to run off the back, Jack Crisp, if he was there, Braden Maynard. So he became a really, a really stable element in that defence, and I think that allowed others to show their strengths around him. Did Did you chat with him over the summer? I did. I went to the practice game um, against Melbourne. I uh, saw North Melbourne their first practice game, and and Murph didn't play. Had a quick chat with him, and and just checked in with how he was going. He. His concerns then or his his utterings then were around the psychological challenge um, because, you know, we, we see these guys go out and, and you see Murph go back to the fight and without a consideration, without any thought for his welfare, without any thought for the repercussions, he just played the game instinctively. And this is often in an aerial situation, it's 
not ironic, but it's yeah, the the ground level contest in the in the grand final is is abnormal for what he with the situations he found himself in. It's generally aerially going back. Um, but he spoke about the psychological challenge more than the physiological challenge. And that was whether he thought he was doing the right thing, whether he felt like he could play the way he needed to play and do the things that he know that he and play the game the way that he wanted to play the game. And then, and then, and he's a big thinker. Like, so he would have been weighing up what is there to gain versus the future, what, my, 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 the rest of my life. Um, where does football fit? Like he, so all of that stuff was in his head and he was considering all of that at the time. And I'm glad that he took his time. I haven't had a, I hadn't had a conversation with him since. He wasn't at training when I went down and had a look at Collingwood last week. Uh, and all the signs were there, I suppose, that it was leaning towards him stepping out. And he took the time that he needed. And I'm sure that it's a difficult decision to make, but it's obviously the right one given the evidence available. He, he was at a dinner that I hosted, I think it was January. It was a racing dinner, about 35 people, Collingwood people, and Nathan evidently loves the horses. So he was yeah. there. And um, we had a chat with the room. It was just a close, intimate room. And he told a, a couple of things. Is the first, he told the story of the grand final and the aftermath. And while everyone else got to celebrate, he had to ready himself to front the medical board. I think he said it was on the Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And then, so he went in and each of his concussions was examined and he would relay to the best of his recollection, what had happened, what the symptoms were, what the aftermath was. And then essentially he leaves the room and his football career is in the hands of that panel for the next half hour while he sits outside and waits. And he gets the verdict that he is, he is clear to continue his football career should he choose to do so. And his rationale at that stage was he just wasn't ready to give up on it. Mm. So he was 23 and he knew that football was a short-term proposition. He wasn't going to be playing mm. into his 30s. He wasn't going to play 200 games. He, but he wasn't ready to give up on it just at that moment. So he spent the summer getting himself ready. And then he has the, the episode training. Um, and he ends up back in front of that board after a long period of time yep. and the verdict goes the other way. So even, even that is, he told the story quite beautifully for the room It's just sitting outside and your career is then out of your hands mm. while you're waiting to hear your verdict and you're called back in. Um, but the, the thing that stayed with me is he knew it was short term from there, but he just wasn't quite ready to give up on his career. And so in the ensuing months with one more episode, that's the progression that's made. Yeah. And I think, look, he, he's, an, he's a great young fella. I, I, I'm, I'm really proud of Murph and he should be really proud of himself. His parents should be really proud of themselves for bringing up such a respectful young man who handles himself the way he handles himself. I, if we zoom out, if we take the helicopter and we zoom out, there's no guarantee. What, what Murph was able to do was not guaranteed. It was not given. So he had to create that opportunity for himself. He made the choice to leave a game that he was very good at cricket to, to go. And he was very good at footy as well. But I don't think um, physically the game, he, he wasn't naturally suited to the game in a physical sense. His, his athleticism or in some, some, in some spaces lack thereof, was a real challenge for him to lift, to raise the bar, to find the power and to work hard in the gym to, to, to become competitive and to do his job. He, spatial awareness was excellent, but he had to grind to find that opportunity for himself. And he did it with a great attitude constantly. And when he got, when he knocked over, when he got knocked over or he, or he didn't quite make the grade or he didn't get quite get what he wanted, he didn't whinge. He didn't complain. He dusted himself off and he went back to work. So in that really small time frame, he was, and, and he's, he is a premiership player. No one will ever take that away from him. So in that time frame, five or six years at a football club, he's, he was able to test himself, passed, mo passed most of the tests, even though he tripped over a couple of hurdles at, you know, at different stages, dust himself off, go again, 
become a significant part of a premiership, have that medal around his neck, regardless of what anyone says, he can, we went from this helicopter view, he can, he can rest easy knowing that he gave everything that he had in him and that he's actually achieved everything that a player wants to in the, in a, in a football career. And I think, he should know that that is success right there. Yep. It's not about how long, it's about how, how you go about it. And he went about it in a great manner. And if, if he does that in the rest of his life, he'll, he'll be great. So I hope he's not, I don't, I hope he doesn't feel dissatisfied. I hope he feels content with the knowledge that he controlled everything in his power and that he has succeeded uh, you know, in the game. And then to, put the helicopter even higher in the way that the game is played. And that action, even of going back with the flight of the ball, um, a coach, uh, so just thinking of recent conversations, yep. a coach told me recently, there is no more conversation ever around whether a player went hard enough at, at the contest. A, a player told me there is, there are now rules around when you go back with a flight. It's, it's not, it, 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 it's we not just your don't turn it. anymore because you no. are no good to us knocked out and all of this goes on. So even as a coaching mechanism with, with a player like Murphy and his style, particularly early on, would we move that away? Would we now train that out as quickly as we could? Well, we've always sort of coached, tried to coach. Okay, when you go back with a flight, turn your body and to take a chesty, like so that you've got your body between the oncoming traffic and, and the ball. And, and it's not just to protect the ball. It's actually to protect you. We, we coach, you know, Toby Green with his foot up, you know, we coach, you coach knee up to protect you from the bodies that are coming towards you to take a mark. Like that, that's always been around protection. You coach turning your turning your body and your head away from a ground level ball to go in sideways. I've said this consistently, Danny Frawley. Don't put your head where your ass can fit. Like <laughs> turn your turn your body around and use parts of you that are that are that are harder to damage, so that you can protect the parts of you that are easier to damage. So, but going back with the flight was seen as a badge of honour back in the day. But I also used to run around the training track with a water tap there, with a tap on the side of the oval, knowing that if you went and had a drink, you'd be seen as a weak, yeah. a, a, as a weak dog. So in the end, it, like we have evolved, thankfully. We've evolved in many ways. We, Luke Nankervis went back to the flight and put his hand out. If he'd have done that in that manner 20 years ago, we'd be saying, well, he squibbed it because he didn't quite – get two hands to it and he didn't quite commit to it. That That is seen now as like you go back with a flight and you, you cop a knee in the, in the back. Like that's, that is, that's the, that's an outlier. We don't see that as often. We have, we see far more players seeing that an aerial contest and choosing to turn around and go front and center. If that happened 20, 30 years ago. You'd actually be criticized for not putting your body on the line. I think we've progressed a long way but you are not going to be able to legislate no. or take contact out of it. Even with Murph, we teach him the right technique. We teach him to go back sideways. He would get in a game. He would come back five minutes into a VFL game and he would run headlong like a Glen Archer, but not with a Glen Archer body, into a, into a pack coming the other way, flat out. And, and, he, would, and, and he would even become – he would be low. He wouldn't be high. He'd be open. He wouldn't turn his shoulder. And we we'd hold our breaths. It just that was the way he was. But that was the way he attacked the contest. He improved his technique as he went along, which gave him a chance, which made him the player, gave him the opportunities um, that he had at senior level. And but ultimately, this has come to pass. And you you can only make decisions based on the available evidence. And and I you have to trust that he's made the decision that's right for him. There's a lot of messages coming through. 40 Wings Temper Text 0433 98 11 16 Temper, a mattress like no other. Thank you, Murph, for what you contributed to our great club and 16th Premiership. Your bravery and commitment has been outstanding. Look after yourself and hats off to you, Murph. That's from Nicole. Jared, I'm absolutely gutted about Murphy. He was the glue in our back line and allowed Darcy Moore, Jeremy Howe and Maynard to play to their absolute best and was often the unsung hero and didn't get the recognition he deserved. I had a feeling 
this guy's courage would cost him his career after seeing how hard he goes at the footy. He will always be known as a Collingwood Premiership hero. One thing that I, that I want to say in all of this is if you saw Nathan Murphy in the locker room and the way that his, play, his teammates interacted with him, he was, he was borderline bullied at times in the locker room. Like he was, he was innocent. He was childlike. Um, he was uh, like he would believe anything someone said, so he would often be taken on a ride. But he used to giggle a lot. He was always light and cheerful. Um, he was he was a beauty. Like and the players, the locker room loved him for his innocence as, and he still has that as a young man. So that's going to be missed as well. It's not just what you bring on the field; it's who you are off the field. And he was like. Like what he was around the place um, was joyful as well. Always a smile on his face. Always, you know, dusty. He he would be bitterly disappointed if he couldn't reach the level that he wanted to, or if he wasn't rewarded. Like he 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 had a real competitive streak in him, and he kept and he's shown that by dusting himself off and going again. But you're not just missing. You won't just miss the footballer. You miss the guy around the locker room as well. And that's only his teammates can really speak to that, um, and I'm sure we'll hear you know, his teammates speak of him in that regard, and um, and, I, and I hope that he hears all of that. It was all eyes to Witten Oval about an hour ago for the weekly press conference of Luke Beveridge. The need for the senior coach to assert the immediate direction amid that fierce debate over the prospects and trajectory of the Western Bulldogs. Beveridge's post-game comments after a disappointing capitulation on Friday night had been broadly extrapolated to concession of the now and planning for the future. That's not how the club was set up for 2024. All the reviewing and the subsequent change of the off-season was about succeeding now. It was indicative of a club that knows it's on the clock with the best years of Marcus Bontempelli. So this morning was one of those moments when Beveridge needed to speak to the three branches of a club. His players to ensure that there are no outs and no misconceptions about giving up on the now. The administration, who hold the coach's tenure in their hands and need absolute alignment. And the fans, who it's pretty clear are largely disgruntled. Too much of the commentary for mine has been about the Bulldogs' need to do the path in the off-season and the trade period, and not enough on what needs to happen on Thursday night. It's time for the dogs to punch hard back into this season. There's a need for clarity in thought, clarity in purpose, clarity in process, and clarity in the words of Luke Beveridge. In the words of Luke Beveridge, so coach for the now, and then the layers inside that as to why senior players, established senior players, uh, aren't getting games, why youth is being preferred, the methodology in that is... Is that the clarity? So Nathan Buckley for Supergroups, first picked every week for Kubota Excavators, supergroups.com.au. Does that provide the the clarity that um, Beveridge left a bit murky after Friday night? Yeah, I, I think it. I think it it does, but it it's never enough to sate, you know, the the angry the angry pack that are that are baying for blood, you know, or, or want immediate. Results now. I want to win the premiership in round six. Let's win it. You know, it can't happen. Um, Texas has just come in. You get. You guys need to open your bloody eyes. Stop going after coaches when it's clearly the players. I do think that in this, in these instances, we do go to the pointy end. And the one position that is responsible for any ill and any success is is the senior coach. And I think Bevo. I've I've looked at Bevo at different times and I've thought I've fallen in uh, to the same thing. I th- geez, I think he's I think he's stubborn, but I think coaches need to be stubborn at times. They need to be stoic at times, and they need to believe in the way they view they way the way they view it. Um, I think he's um, combative, but I think coaches need to be combative at times. I also know that he's been a perennial winner over his time, so maybe he hasn't been in these situations as often as he might have over the years, especially with this level of scrutiny and publicity. I don't fall into the disconnect in a football club. I don't think that that is there. There are always, um, there's always friction um, amongst football clubs and, and key and the key parts of a football club when you're trying to build 
your next version of what's successful for you. I do think they should have won that game on the weekend. And, and I do think that their team, the team that they that hit the park, should have performed a lot better than it did. How much of that is due to coaching? How much of it is due to selection? It's all been slated down to the selection of two players out of 23. I don't think that is a finite reason for their performance on the weekend. So he was asked straight up whether you can contend, whether he is contending with this team while rejuvenating the team. Yeah, got, I can I can understand why people would sit, listen to that and say, that's piffle. You know, that, that doesn't ring true to me. But everything that he is saying is talking about, it's not getting caught in. He's not saying, hey, Bramble, Bramble and Baker played really badly. Because if he said, if, if a coach says that publicly, then you, you, you've, lost, you've lost those players and the rest of your players for the rest of your time. You don't throw players under the bus. But he's also caught between saying what's actually happened and one of the, one of the reasons. And, and there would be other players that did not step up on the weekend, but he's chosen not to name and shame. He's chosen to say that we were we were under we underperformed today. I understand the selection questions and, and it's pretty hard to answer those in the short term, but we don't have all the information. I don't know why Caleb Daniel's not getting a game. I don't know why Bailey Dale's starting as the sub. I don't know why Jack McRae's had to fight for his position. Or Jack McRae probably a little bit more understandable because their midfield stacked and McRae doesn't play anywhere else but there. Gallagher's come in as a young kid and he looks he looks um, like the type of player worth persisting with. But he might go out and get turned out at different stages. O'Donnell's selection to me made absolute sense when he described it. We need more support for our tall backs. Jones and Karmas are doing great, but we don't want to use Richards or Duray to go back and chop them out when they, ha- when they have to get their 10 or 15% breather of game time. So we're going to get a young kid to come in and do that. And it's not just for that week. It's for, hopefully, in... Six weeks' time when O'Donnell has six weeks under his belt and that three are healthy and going well, that act, that, that actually makes sense. Um, West is going really well. Norton isn't quite hitting the mark. Darcy's looking great. Hugo Hagen's looking great. Waitman's you know, chopping in and playing his role at different times. What happened on the weekend was that their A-graders were, were blunted. If Bontempelli or, or Liberatore, or uh, Liber, Liber still at 25, but if Bontempelli plays an eight out or seven out of 10, an eight out of 10 game. That was a five out of 10 game for him. You don't see that very often, but that had a significant impact on the way that the team played. And it was all credit to Essendon and Sam Durham and the job that he did, but they were bested on, on the day. Um, I, I think, and then, but then the narratives bleed in from the last 18 months. And when you don't win, that's going to happen. Bucks, just to tidy up the beverage, how yep. important to state clearly today that they're in it for the now was it for the three branches of the footy club? I think particularly for the players, who and you always say you're talking to when you do your public addresses, the administration mm. who they spent the whole summer preparing for the now and then the supporter group, which is um, disgruntled. Well, he, his presser immediately after the game was when I talked to the supporters yeah, and then he he answered that question. The definite, the, the most important communication is to the players, and no one is going to be, but the players and the coaches, and the football department are going to be sitting in that match committee room or in the in the review room, privy to those conversations. And I suppose we find out a little bit, you know, what that looks like in the next month or so. How how energised are the players? How much belief do they have? And Bevo says they've got it. And to be honest, the, the last three, the three weeks leading into Essendon, their pressure was through the charts, number one in the comp for that three weeks. Now, that was Gold Coast, West Coast and Geelong. Number one pressure team, number one intercept team. So they, 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 there was a bit going right in that three weeks post the, the, um, the round one loss to Melbourne. And I think they're tracking the right way, but they've had a loss that, that wasn't expected. Their next month looks okay. And I look at the team and I think, well... If you just if that changes two or three here and there, and players find form, or say it is Caleb Daniel or Bailey Dale, or 
James Harms, who's in the twos, or Alex Keith, who's in the who's in the twos. There, there's a few there that that have. There's some depth there at the Bulldogs, and there's probably some names. Garcia had a really good game in the VFL. We don't know about the young blokes, but every player needs to feel like they're working towards finding a way that their strength is going to contribute to the betterment of the team. That's what they need to believe, and they all need to believe that they're a part of something that's going to be special. You, if you believe that and the coach's job is to sell that and when you've got all of this happening around you, it, the, the, the sell job is more difficult. But he needs to make sure that the players' hearts and minds and the staff's hearts and minds are with him and with each other towards an outcome. And, and when you've got all of the, when the storm is happening around you, it makes the job a little harder. But that's when you've just got to, you've, you've, as a coach, you've got to be more open, more vulnerable, more honest, put, it, put all the cards on the table and trust, let go a little bit and trust that, that, that the players will buy into each other and to you and then you go from there. You don't want to have to do that too often because you don't want to be in this situation too often. But really, it's a, it's a media storm and they can perform their way out of it. They're two and three. It's not... It's not zero and five, and there's some teams that are zero and five at the moment. Yep. Punch back into the season and punch back hard on Thursday night.